Welcome to this training on sacred altars. As we begin this time together, I want to invite you to bring your full attention and your intention into this room and into your body. So please put away any distractions that you are experiencing and focus right here and now with me and take a few moments to come into your breath. If you want to close or lower your eyes, you can. Breathing in through your nose and breathing out through your mouth. Breathing in through your nose and out through your mouth. Bringing your awareness into your center. Bringing your focus right here into your heart. A large part of shamanic practice has to do with being in your power and being in command of your energy. And one of the ways we do that is through our intention and through our breath. So just bringing your focus right into the center here with me as we begin. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for your full attention. I am excited to share with you uh, information about the sacredness of altars. What I'm going to be sharing is the purpose for creating sacred altars, the meaning of what's placed on them, the power of the directional energies, and the practice of creating something that's called a spirit house, which is usually placed on or near an altar. So uh, as we begin, and as we began with the breath, I want to remind us that sacred spaces that we create in our homes, in our places, in our, um, in our lives, the, the sacred spots that we create are important and equally important is the sacred space that we create within ourselves. And so we just laid a little bit of groundwork for creating the sacred space within ourselves, Coming in with a focus, breathing, and then opening up. I have my palms up, I don't know if you can see them. Opening up to the divine, opening up to spirit, creator, God, goddess, the life force. That allows us to create a sacred space right here and now. And as we do that, we create, um, we create the opportunity to understand and for this information to move in a little deeper into our minds and our hearts. So altars have been known to humanity for as long as humans have been in reverence, in worship, in relationship, in devotion to and with the divine in whatever form and shape and whatever label we put on it. It looks a little different in China than it does in Africa. It looks a little different in um, North America than it does in Mongolia. And of course it's gonna look a little different. Altars are gonna look a little different depending on what your religion, spirituality, your culture, your practice looks like, right? But there are a couple of uniting factors in the purpose of creating an altar. And one of them is to connect with the divine. No matter where you come from and what your practice and belief is, there is a understanding that people are able to connect with the divine. So altars help us connect with the divine. They also help us to honor the divine and have a place for holding reverence, not just in our hearts, but physically a space and a place for holding reverence for what we consider to be holy. The altars also allow us to interact with the divine in specific ways that I'll share in a moment. And they also allow us to call forth and welcome in the energy of the divine. We set up that space and it becomes a rich and vibrant place to welcome in all that we hold sacred. Large communities, large community altars are often built within a shrine, which is a large structure that's devoted to the spirits or devoted to the gods. In a church, which would be considered a shrine, an altar is placed inside a church. 
in a Buddhist temple, which is considered a, a shrine or could be considered a shrine. Altars are placed in the temple. And many have particular rules. Uh, many traditions, cultures have different rules, particular rules for community altars versus personal altars. Personal altars are often more relaxed than community al altars or altars that are dedicated to specific deities or spirits per tradition. And altars look different depending on traditions. If you're looking at a Catholic altar, you're going to be probably experiencing candles, pictures of saints, and icons that depict Jesus and Mary and the Catholic um, uh, pantheon of beings, right? Um, in Buddhism, there is something that's called a butsudan. I may be pronouncing that wrong, but that's okay. I'm not a Buddhist. <laughs> that has a scroll inside uh, a box with doors. And the scroll is considered sacred and has holy words on it. And in front of that scroll, there might be fruit and incense placed. Very different from the candles and the pictures of Jesus, right? On a Catholic altar. Hindu altars may be centered around a particular deity like Ganesha or Shiva and Parvati. And that altar would look and feel like the energy of that deity because it would be devoted specifically to that one deity. In the neo-pagan practices, and pagans are folks who are of connect with spirit God creator through the earth. Um, and a lot of them follow a path that leads them to the divine through both a masculine and feminine, which they label God and goddess uh, energy and the elements. So you may find depictions of those pieces on someone's altar if they are a modern practicing pagan. In shamanic, on a shamanic altar, you're going to find uh, representations of the spirits of a personal shaman's path. Um, spirits of nature, energies of nature, personal spirits, ancestral spirits. are Those energies are going to be honored on a shamanic altar. So as you can see, altars look different if they are for, um, they look different for different reasons and with, within different paths. The meaning of what's placed on the altar also has significance. And that also varies depending on who is creating the altar. And altars are often faced in a particular direction, which is uh, largely due to um, tradition. And it's also largely due to the energy that the different directions represent. So by the directions, I mean the north, the south, the east, and the west, the four directions. Um, that also correlate to elemental energies, water, fire, earth, and air. The east is known for newness. And that is simply because the east is the place, no matter where you are on the planet, where the sun rises. The sun rises in the east. Um, the sun also sets in the west. And so there is a rising and a falling that happens in the east and the west. And depending on how you, you, you can situate your altar or people situate their altars um, according to the energy of those directions. And those are just two simple examples of um, directional energies. Personally, I like the energy of the north and the east for for my um, for placing my altars. I also personally like to place my altars near a window because that's what feels good to me. I can look outside and into uh, the outside, into the sky, into nature. <clears throat> um, there are uh, on. I lost my place. How about that? <laughs> so I'm talking about the meaning of what's placed on them. First, I talked about the meaning of the direction that the altar is facing. Uh, that is very specific according to tradition. An example is the east is where the sun rises, the west is where the sun sets. And that may factor into where someone places an altar. Sometimes altars um, are placed facing in certain directions uh, based on what... Uh, based on what a personal belief is. 
So on an altar, you will find a variety of items and objects. You will often find a cloth that's on top of an altar. It may be a significant, it may be a certain um, material. It may be knit, it may be woven, it may be a piece of cloth that came through the family line. There are so many possibilities for what that altar cloth could look like. It's a covering, almost like a tablecloth for a dinner table. It's a covering and it lets you know that you're moving into, that you're creating something sacred and sacred items are gonna be placed here. The energy of an uh, altar cloth that has been passed down through generations is, is that you get the energy of the ancestors and all of that meaning in that cloth because it's passed through so many hands. Um, sometimes people will put some, um, a scarf on their altar in lieu of an altar cloth and that scarf represents the covering of the or is the covering of the altar. Many people will change out their altar coverings depending on the ritual or the celebration that's happening or depending on the season. I know for me, I will change my altar cloths out seasonally so that I have a little bit of seasonal energy in um, my altar cloth. I also have a few altar cloths that were made for specific reasons for me and I will put them on my altar when I'm guided to or when the time is right. So in addition to that, so we've got the altar facing a certain direction. We've got a cloth of, of some sort that covers the altar. And then we have the possibility or the likelihood that there will be statues on the altar. Statues of gods and goddesses that are central to um, someone's beliefs. Uh, statues of uh, deities that are central to someone's belief. Statues of spirit animals that are central to someone's beliefs. Um, that may or may not include sacred objects that are in relation to a spirit animal. It is common on a shamanic altar to see um, representations of different animals, but also to see parts of animals such as wings or bones or claws or skulls because those pieces hold the energy of that animal and um, having them on the altar helps a person to connect with that energy. Now, typically with shamanic practices, when someone has a claw or a feather or something that has come from physically from the body of an animal or a bird, that animal or bird has been honored and a ceremony has taken place so that the shaman or practitioner is in right relationship with that animal so that they can connect with that part in that way. Sometimes on an altar there are things that your deities or your uh, spirit helpers request. Those may be, oh gosh, I think we're going to cover that in a minute. They may be um, anywhere from food to water to pictures to things that, that honor that personal deity or personal spirit animal. There's often some type of fireproof shell or plate for burning herbs, incense, um, natural materials that are um, burnt for ceremonies and different practices. Um, so that is a, so those are some of the things that you will find on, on an altar. Things that represent directional energies, that represent that which is being honored. Um, also things that are represent the uh, offerings that are made for those energies that are being honored. Um, I was looking at my notes here. I want to talk a little bit about the power of the directional and elemental energies. I may have mentioned it earlier, but um, particularly in shamanic practices and in modern day pagan practices, the elements are life. The water is very connected to our blood. 
water is, our bodies are also made up of 80% of water. And um, so water is very much an inherent part of us. Water is um, also represented in our blood because our blood is liquid. Water is a source of life. Food comes from the waters and also the ability to cleanse ourselves, to clear ourselves, to, um, is all present in the water. Emotions and working through and with emotions are regarded to be water work. We connect through to our emotions through water and with water. Our intuition is often associated with the energy and the element of water. So all of those associations connect us with water and are understood to be worked with when we work with the energy of water. So someone will, um, people will often have a dish or a bowl that has water on it. And that's for a couple of reasons. To honor everything I just mentioned about water uh, and also to offer in uh, to offer prayers and blessings for the water I know for me I have a bowl of water always on my altar it evaporates and then I refill it and each time I fill the water I say a prayer and a blessing for the water and I offer gratitude for the waters and the planet running clean so my water on my altar doesn't just represent the importance of water. It represents my desire to bless up the waters um, for the planet. Air, the element of air, which is often represented by feathers and um, things that connect us to our bird friends. Um, air is connected to the breath. The air carries our prayers to spirit. If you've ever seen prayer flags, um, which are um, often hanging in trees, connected to Buddhist and Tibetan practices, the prayers are written on the flags. And over time, the wind wears away the fabric. And it's believed that the prayers are taken to spirit, are blown to the way to, with the wind to spirit. And as those prayer flags dissipate dissipate as they dissolve as they disintegrate that's the word I'm looking for as they disintegrate those prayers are being taken and um, given to the spirits or given to the wind um, so air is a very important element and I could go on and on about air and the sacredness of it it's our breath it carries our prayers it also carries sound and which is very very healing and very very important and sound carries a vibration that we feel in our bodies but a lot of it we hear we hear the energy of sound and we hear that because the air allows the sound to travel to us so air is a sacred element that is revered and represented on an altar and then we move to fire fire is the Sun fire is light fire is how we cook our food fire is at the source of electricity Fire is, um, well, it has a few different colors within it, but fire is often orange red, which is the color of our blood. And um, fire illuminates what is hidden. Fire is also one of the primal forces that connects us with spirit and creates community. While fire doesn't create community, we create community around fire. So fire is an important element for all of us. Having a representation of the fire on the altar is often easy to do because it's usually a candle or candles that represent the fire. And then we move to the fourth element, which is earth. Earth is very connected to our bodies. Our bodies are of earth. We are born from a body that was born from a body. And when we are done with this life and done with this body the, our bodies go back into the earth uh, so <clears throat> the earth is the energy of the earth is found in the trees it's found in the rocks i have uh, rocks on my altar i'm looking over here because my altar's over here i have rocks on my altar some of which i've just found 
and they speak to me, some of which I find and I know that they're going to be used for healing, and some of which are painted with um, different uh, uh, spirit allies that I'm connected with. I'll go into that in a little bit, but I have a lot of rocks on the altar. They're very grounding. They remind us to be in our body, and they help to pull us into our own truth. So those are just a little bit, or that's just a little bit of a explanation of around the elements and how the elements really are connected to our lives and how having representations of them on the altar connects us to all life, but drives us further into our connection to ourselves in the natural world. When we are in a good relationship with the elements, when we honor them, we are in harmony. Right now, we are not in relation, right relationship with the elements um, at, on the planet right now. We're just not. We are almost at war with the water and the earth. And I know that there's like uh, big things that need to change. And that you as a human being can only do so much. Everything that you do matters. And every choice that you make matters. And when you make a choice to honor the water and the fire and the earth and the air. And you bring that into your sacred space. That reverence. That honoring creates a vibration in your heart. And that vibration opens up and is shared with other people and shared with the world. So you can, by honoring the elements, you honor all life and then you make it, you make it easier for others to do the same. <sighs> and what's interesting is, is that a lot of folks have, well, a lot of folks have a history with Christianity and Catholic rituals. And in those rituals and on those altars, they don't come out and tell you that there are elemental forces on the altar, but they're incorporated and insinuated in Catholic and Christian rituals. You um, will often, you know, if you think about the bells that are used, which I don't know if I mentioned, they are connected to the element of air. Bells also are one of the creative vibration that clears the air, that uh, um, calls in a frequency or, or that creates a bells create a frequency that draw in high vibrational beings and sort of cast out energies that don't match that. And bells are a fundamental part of altars on in um in Christian practices. There's water that is used. Um, and if you watch in a Catholic ceremony, a priest will um, move his incense um, wand or incense carrier and sprinkle water in the four directions because that is an honoring um, of, it's, a, it's an old way it's a um, pre-Christian way of honoring the elements and calling for balance, although they're not telling you that as they're doing that. There are pre-Christian um, practices that are in most modern-day Christian practices. I think, um, yeah, so we covered what, uh, we covered elemental representations on the altar, bowls of water, candles, feathers, bells, stones, shells having those pieces on your altar helps you to balance out your connection with the elements i'm just going to take a drink of water here and ask you to take a breath because i'm sharing a lot of information here okay also on the altar are a variety of stones and those can be Rocks, minerals, crystals, gemstones, even fossils could be put into that category, I guess. And they're often used for their grounding properties, but used for healing. Right here I have one of my crystals that I have on my altar is a very um, grounding for me. And it also, I use it in healing work. So that's on my altar. I also have a little bowl that's made of stone, right? that is represents earth and water on it. So I have 
lot of stones on my altar that are used for healing. And whenever anything is placed on the altar, it gets and gathers energy that is powerful and sacred because you're doing devotional, meditative work at your altar. Sometimes people have coins or money on their altar. And there are many reasons for that. The coins or money may be an offering to a deity. In some traditions, Hindu traditions, Tibetan traditions, money is offered um, and part of a ritual for honoring a deity. Sometimes when people are calling in more financial abundance, they will put money on their altar because you attract like attracts like. And when you have money on your altar, you're blessing it up. And when you bless up money, you bless up your relationship with it. So having money on the altar. Another thing that's on altar, there's a lot of things that can be on an altar, are tools. Tools that are used for healing work. Tools that are used for ceremonial work. I can show you right here. I have a tool, one of the tools that I made for my shamanic work that has to do with extracting energies that don't belong in a person's body. So tools are on an altar as well as um, instruments that are used to connect with the spirits. Drums, rattles may be placed around the altar. I always have rattles around my altar. Um, and then we have a whole category of, of things that we would fall under offerings. And those, that category, the category of offerings varies depending on your tradition. Sometimes there's an offering that's made and it's always to honor, to honor the spirits, to honor the ancestors, to honor um, the energies that you're working with. There are liquids that are offered on the altar. Alcohol is one of the liquids. Sometimes water or tea or a certain tincture is offered to the spirits or to the deities. I know for, um, and it's not just on an altar, sometimes in sacred ceremonies, their liquids are poured to honor the occasion. Um, I know in, on my father's side of the family, which is, uh, comes from Ireland, alcohol is poured on people's graves to honor them. And um, alcohol can be found um, and poured as a libation on an altar for a deity or for an ancestor. Sometimes there are specific foods that are offered on an altar. S foods that are either requested by a spirit or a deity, or they are part of a tradition that your grandmother or grandfather taught you. So those foods can be sweets, they can be candies and honey to represent the sweetness of life or to honor a deity who likes sweets. Um, they can be the favorite foods of an ancestor, sometimes at specific times of years. Uh, shamanic people, pagan people, earth-centered people will put foods that their ancestors loved on their altar. I know for me, my grandmother, who I am was very close to. She likes these little orange slice candies. And so when it's ancestor time, which in my experience and spiritual belief is in the turning of the seasons at fall, October, November, I will honor her by putting orange slices in a bowl next to her picture on my altar. Another thing that is offered is flowers. Um, flowers to honor the dead flowers to honor the spirits, um, incense is also honored. And what I, what is cool to me is, is that there are the offerings on an altar speak to all senses. There's a visual aspect to what you're seeing on an altar. There's a, um, olfactory, um, aspect because you can smell the incense, the flowers, the offerings on the altar. And you can also listen to some of the, um, listen to the instruments and the things like that that you have on your altar. Herbs like sage and tobacco are also offerings and found on uh, altars. Cornmeal is, cornmeal is one of the ones 
that is um, typically North American First Nations people, because there's a lot of corn here, um, work with cornmeal as an offering. So you can find a variety. Oh, we could talk about this at length. There are many things to offer to the spirits. And those offerings are found and placed. They're found on an altar. They're placed on an altar because they're part of rituals that are sacred to the people. Okay. The last thing I want to talk about is something that's called a spirit house. Now, cultures all over the world have their ways of connecting with the land and the spirits. And a spirit house, or often there's a symbolic dwelling or sitting place for shamanic spirits. Um, I know that in the Mongolian traditions, um, and there's a book that's called Chosen by the Spirits by a woman named Saren Garrel, who was a Mongolian shaman. She was an influence for my teacher and then also became an influence for me through my teacher. Um, talks about the um, ungun, which is a spirit house, which um, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit now, is a symbolic dwelling or sitting place for shamanic spirits. It's a tool for interacting with the spirits. Um, I'm thinking right now of uh, in Thailand, which is in Southeast Asia, the, a spirit house is a dedicated structure that honors the guardians of the land. So it's made for a particular spirit, um, and it literally looks like a little house or a little palace. Um, people's modern lifestyle in Thailand includes this, um, and they're found all over um, in that region. In front of the houses, they're um, placed, and offerings are made daily to them of coconut milk and rice. I think only like a priest or a, a certain kind of priest or a master of ceremony can install or take the spirit house down in that tradition. In Mongolian tradition, I got a little ahead of myself, the Angun is a spirit house and it's a physical extension of the spirit for which it's made. It's created by the shaman and it's worn, carried, or placed on altars. Um, my teacher, Becky, will often um, create a spirit house and ungun for um, her spirits through her craft of beading. She doesn't create a structure per se, but she will bead um, an animal part or something that's connected to her spirits and then that becomes her spirit house. And she wears it or has it on her altar. And the energy of whatever spirit it is, spirit ally that she's working with, is in that piece that she's made it. I have painted stones that represent my spirits. Um, typically, spirit houses are created out of natural, item and natural items. And the spirit of the ally is brought into that house or that object. And then if we're really traditional in Mongolian practice and also in the practice from Southeast, Southeast Asia, they're fed, the spirits are fed with a little dab of honey or a little bit of oil. There's a celebratory offering that's given because it really is believed and understood that the spirit and the energy of that, that ally is in that stone um, and lost my train of thought in that tradition in the Mongolian tradition it's understood as far as I'm aware that anybody who touches a spirit house will be able to connect in with your spirits that you work with so if you don't want people to do that, you don't let them touch your spirit house. You keep that for yourself. So these are all ideas of traditional and contemporary ways to honor the secret. Um, there are we're we're living we're living in um, a revivalist time. We don't have access 
often to 100% lineaged practices. So what we can do is honor what we do know about indigenous practices from all over the globe. And then in conjunction with our own guides and allies and spirits, ask for what is going to be the right thing for us to do. Ask what is going to be the right way for me to honor you. What is going to be the right way for me to create my altar? What what is important to put on my altar? How shall I do this? Because when we are in a relationship where we're asking, we're getting information directly from the spirits. And that's going to guide our path. That's going to guide us even more strongly than trying to do what somebody else says we should do. And that's my whole goal with this training is to let you know general the general concept and idea of altars what are can be placed on them and why so that you can see what feels meaningful to you and you can create your own altar and sacred space that will enhance your relationship with spirit magnify all the work that you're doing so i hope that this has been useful for you i hope that you take this information and bring it into your heart and see what additions you would like to make to an already constructed altar or think about constructing a simple altar yourself if you haven't already. Okay, I look forward to your questions and I'll speak with you soon. Bye for now. Hey there, if you're liking what you find here and what you're watching here on my channel, then you're gonna need to check out my free training. Awaken the Wisdom Within is a three part mini series where I show you how to start working with your energy so that you can tap more deeply into your intuition and do what you came here to do. Heal, transform, make the difference that you are here to make. I'll, leave, I'll drop the link below and then I'll see you in the next video.